Good morning, everyone. Um, we're sort of getting out of the way of streaming with no one else in church. And I just remembered about a minute ago that it was suggested when we were streaming for months and end that it would be helpful to have a little bit of chit chat before 11 o'clock came round. So that's all I'm doing, and I think I'm welcoming you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for those who join us later, interstate and overseas, some of you, and for telling us when things go wrong and when things go well. So I'm now going to hand over to the minister to take us into our service. Minister, indeed. Thank you, Christine. We, uh, we look forward to uh, hearing in the course of the next couple of days in Victoria whether our lockdown is going to be lifted or extended. So the notices are going to be profoundly affected by that. Our Wednesday prayer time at 1.30 uh, may just be a covenanted prayer time. Uh, and uh, next Sunday service may, like this service, simply be streamed and, uh, and not in person. But uh, we'll keep you appraised of that as we understand what happens. We're going to worship God together now. I'd like to invite you to join in prayer as we turn our thoughts towards God and uh, unite our hearts, even though we can't be physically together. So let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the technology that enables us to communicate vision and sound across distance. We thank you for the way it's become accessible uh, through the technology that we use. We realize that technology is a double-edged sword, that it can seduce us as well as be of service. We pray that you'll help us uh, in this service to use what you've given in ways that serve the interests of your kingdom and to carry forward the concerns of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that uh, carrying his name as Christian people, we uh, can look forward to the presence of your spirit to lead and guide us. So Lord, in this service, do us good, journey with us through the elements that we share together now. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to bring Christine back for Young at Heart. Thank you, Christine. Yes, well, I have labelled my talk today the power of song. could also have been the power of singing. Um, I was had the wrong side of my notes. I wonder what comes to your mind when you think of song or songs or singing. For me, it's a multitude of experiences. Learning Scottish songs, mostly in English, some in Gaelic, although I never, unlike my sister, I never learned Scottish Gaelic. But when I was young, we did sing a lot. We also sang in the Sunday school and church. School assemblies were very, very hearty singing, especially if someone had won something. And I'm sure there's lots more. Of course, now it's sort of added to that, the singing to children decades ago and singing to grandchildren more recently. There was one question that Ernest Shackleton asked every applicant for his at historic attempt to make a transatlantic crossing in 1914. He asked every applicant, can you sing? When Rick Riscoria and you might enjoy reading about Rick. He's less well known. He helped 2,700 occupants of the South Tower of the Twin Towers to safety on 9-11. It's an amazing story. To help them not panic as they left, he sang the Cornish song. I thought it was Welsh, but Graham tells me it's Cornish. Men of Harlech, as he escorted them down the stairwell from the 14th floor. Through the COVID pandemic, we have enjoyed many examples of group singing via Zoom across the country and often across the world. 
In recent weeks, there have been two examples of communal singing which have featured across most and possibly all of our news channels. The first was Samoan fruit pickers coming to work in Australia who sang their gratitude on the balconies of their Hobart Hotel. A man from Samoa, now living in Tasmania, conducted this service. This was part of a service. Another, Tasman another Samoan resident commented, Singing is a way of lifting spirits. It keeps us positive in our soul and mind because people in Samoa always pray to God. Everything we do is something we do for our country. These, many of these workers will not see their families now for three years. I think most of them won't see them for nine months, but some are contracted for three years. Now, in connection with the Olympics, which I certainly have been enjoying, especially last night's high jump, women's high jump, the Fijian rugby sevens team caught the attention not only of Australian but of all Olympic viewers across the world singing, We Shall Overcome. The captain said, we always start with our prayers and songs and we always end with our prayers and songs. And that song says that our God is a loving God and that while we always tend to stray from what he expects for, of us, he still loves us and gives us good things. The 2016 Fiji Sevens team praised the Lord after winning the inaugural Rugby Sevens Olympic gold. But Two Way said the, we the win, I think, the week before last at these Olympics was even more special. The squad, like many, if not all Olympic squads, had endured quite a bit before they got to Tokyo. We have been away for five months, he said. My father passed away just last year. He was the man who encouraged me to play rugby and this gold medal is for him and for my baby boy. My baby boy is one year old now and I haven't seen him for five months. How much changes are between seven and 12 months in the life of a child? I didn't even get to kiss him goodbye. That's because Fiji went into a sudden lockdown. I didn't get to kiss him but goodbye when I left. It's tough. And he started to tear up. By the time the players fly home and complete quarantine, they won't have seen their families for 20 weeks, but they have overcome. En route, and I love this aspect of their story, en route to Japan, the team flew over on a cargo flight along with a few dozen crates of frozen fish but they say that this was all part of the bonding and that you won't find a tighter group now than this team. So after they won Olympic gold, they immediately turned to praising God. May we be able to take heart from these examples of public thanking of God in the secular world of the 21st century. The Bible reminds us that all good gifts come from God. In Psalm 16, the psalmist says, I say to the Lord, you are my God. All good things I have come from you. And James, in his letter, chapter 1, verse 17, reminds his readers, every good and every perfect gift comes from God. May we be grateful for all gifts, big and small, and remember to thank God for them. Now, the notes of my talk will be, courtesy of Ken, uploaded to the website. And there you can find a link 
to the Fijian rugby sevens team singing and also to other as if you go on the internet you'll find links to p the, you'll find the spelling of Rick Crescoria and so on so may God bless us all with thankful hearts thank you Christine the power of praise and song indeed I'm now um, in preparation for our Bible reading and our subsequent reflection, uh, I'm going to play a, a four-minute uh, video from uh, the Bible Project because we're moving into the third section of a book of Acts. This is our 10th sermon and reflection on Acts, uh, and it moves into really the second half, and it's, the, uh, it's summarized in this section of the Bible Project. Once I start it, I'll uh, click on closed captions so the closed captions are available for uh, anyone who can't uh, actually hear the text. Third road trip. Paul's reputation had grown. He had made many new friends, 
but it also made many new enemies that he would be wise to avoid. But Paul didn't avoid them. His next stop was Jerusalem, a city full of people who wanted him arrested, even dead. And so why he goes to Jerusalem and what happens when he gets there, that's what the final section of Acts is all about. So the Bible reading this morning is Acts chapter 13, verses 26 to 52, which is the end of the chapter. Now, it, it, I'm starting reading when Paul in, it's already into a speech by Paul in Pisidian Antioch. My fellow Israelites, descendants of Abraham, and all Gentiles here who worship God. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. For the people who live in Jerusalem and their leaders did not know that he is the Savior, nor did they understand the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Yet, they made the prophet's words come true by condemning Jesus. And even though they could find no reason to pass the death sentence on him, they asked Pilate to have him put to death. And after they had done everything that the scriptures say about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from death, and for many days he appeared to those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now witnesses for him to the people of Israel, and we are here to bring that good news to you. What God promised our ancestors he would do, he has now done for us who are their descendants, by raising Jesus to life. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. And this is what God said about raising him from death, never to rot away in the grave. I will give you the sacred and sure blessings that I promised to David. As indeed he says in another passage, you will not allow your devoted servant to rot in the grave. For David served God's purposes in his own time, and then he died, was buried with his ancestors, and his body rotted in the grave. But this did not happen to the one whom God raised from death. We want you to know, my fellow Israelites, that it is through Jesus that the message about forgiveness of sins is preached to you, and that everyone who believes in him is set free from all the sins from which the law of Moses could not set you free. Take care then, so that what the prophet said may not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and die. For what I am doing today is something that you will not believe, even when someone explains it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to come back the next Sabbath and tell them more about these things. After the people had left the meeting, Paul and Barnabas were followed by many Jews and by many Gentiles who had been converted to Judaism. The apostles spoke to them and encouraged them to keep living in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly everyone in the town came to hear the word of the Lord. When the, Jews saw, when the Jews saw the crowds, 
They were filled with jealousy. They disputed what Paul was saying and insulted him. But Paul and Barnabas spoke out even more boldly. It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. But since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we will leave you and go to the Gentiles. For this is the commandment that the Lord has given us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles so that all the world may be saved. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the Lord's message. And those who had been chosen for eternal life became believers. The word of the Lord spread everywhere in that region. But the Jews stirred up the leading men of the city and the Gentile women of high social standing who worshipped God. They started a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and threw them out of their region. The apostles shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went on to Iconium. The believers in Antioch were full of joy and of the Holy Spirit. May God bless his word to us. Thank you, Christine. May God bless his word indeed. Well, we're thinking about St. Paul in particular, and uh, I've used as a, uh, an image on the screen uh, a mosaic uh, purportedly of St. Paul. We have no idea what he actually looked like, uh, except that uh, he's generally depicted as uh, someone with a receding hairline and a beard. Um, so here, this will do for us today. And uh, today we're going to begin traveling with St. Paul. I just felt like a, a journey. We can't travel much in lockdown. Uh, we're pretty confined. Um, and I, I've been interested in Paul's journeys for quite a long time. I, I realized as I was thinking about today that my first real interest in Paul's missionary journeys probably began when I was looking through a New Testament I was given. It's the oldest book I think I have. Um, I was given it when I was two years old. And it depicts a young apostle Paul as a boy watching the shipping coming in and out uh, of a harbor near Tarsus. Sixty years ago, so some time after that, I, uh, I drew a map, a freehand map, of the Mediterranean region, and I marked Paul's journeys on it. And uh, an elderly friend of the family encouraged me to put it into uh, a sort of a Sunday school work that kids were doing uh, at Mooney Ponds Presbyterian Church, and uh, I was pleased to have it uh, recognized there. And that was... Uh, uh, I loved drawing maps. I felt my shaky hand was pretty good for defining coastlines. So we're going to travel with St. Paul, and we're going to look at highs and lows of his journey. And uh, how significant is this? Well, uh, in uh, the Australian last week, uh, weekend I think it was, there was a quotation from Greg Sheridan, uh, which alluded to the idea of a new way of being a human being. And I've, I've put that article in the leaflet this week. So I've used the same image on the front of the leaflet. And inside, there's a map of the journey and a quotation from the Australian. And uh, this was submitted by John Leach. John, who doesn't make it to church here anymore, uh, is uh, sharp in mind and ever vigilant as he reads the papers. And so he sent me an email with this reference, and I put it in the leaflet this week. So as Christine alluded to it, you can download the two leaflets this week from the church website, courtesy of Ken, in a PDF format. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 13 and 14. I've never preached on this whole chunk before, and there'll be some things I'll be missing out, but I'm hoping to get, you'll get a feel of the dynamism of what's going on at this particular time. So we're going to look at 
briefly what was the motive of this journey and where did they actually go. I'm going to think about the strategy of engagement. What was it that, uh, how did Paul go about his ministry, his, his act of serving the Gentile communities in particular, and the opposition and the welcome that he encountered. So first of all, the motive and the itinerary. Well, I notice every week as the Saturday age comes in, there's a section called the traveler. I wonder if you still look at the traveler or if you just think traveling's not on at all at the moment. They're trying to make it appealing. They're making big emphasis on domestic local travel. Um, so I I'm, want to show you a, a map that I came across a few years ago. I'm not sure how well you can read this, but this is a map of the roads of the Roman Empire, but it's done in the format of the London Underground. And uh, up in the top left, there's a, a map with a, a little line running up the, the uh, far left here. I'll point it out. This line here. In the 1960s, I was uh, working as a surveyor in my summer holidays in the Scottish borders. And on the ordnance survey map that we were using, and we were putting in a water reticulation scheme, uh, I said, what's this on the map to the engineer who was my senior? And he said, that's Watling Street. I said, Watling Street? He said, yes, it's a Roman road. It runs down the entire length of Britain. It comes right up here into the Scottish borders. Well, that's Watling Street on that map. But let's go a little bit closer to where we are. This is just Italy, Greece, and Turkey. These are the areas, among others, that are burning today. They're on fire. We've seen these areas in the news. And I want to go particularly just to Turkey. So let's have a look at this part. And I'm hoping that you can make out some of the detail here. So last Sunday, we were in Antioch. And well, that's where we begin today. And we're going to journey uh, through, across to Crete and then up through Asiana into Iconium and then two smaller cities which don't actually rate on the map and then we're going to come back to Antioch. That's what chapters 30, where chapters 13 and 14 take us. The, uh, the physical map of the area shows us that in the southern Turkey, just north of Crete, there are the Taurus Mountains. So this journey involved going across uh, to Crete and then up into this part of Turkey and then up over a mountain pass onto the high plateau that is in south-central Turkey. You can see that the mountains come close to the coast in this image, the, di the dark areas. And this is a part of the area that's been burning recently. And people on the coast have been getting evacuated, sometimes by boat. So it's, a difficult, it's difficult terrain. The Romans put major highways across their empire. But altogether, there are roughly 400,000 kilometers of paved roads. 400,000. So this is an amazing road network. The map you'll find in your Bible probably looks a bit like this. This is Paul's first missionary journey. And you see he begins, as we said, in Antioch. He crosses to Salamis and then Paphos, and then comes up here to Perga in Pamphylia, before going up to Icon Antioch and then Icon Iconium, then Lystra and Derbe, and then he backtracks. He comes uh, across here before coming back to Antioch. So this is... A significant journey. What was the itinerary? Well, that was the itinerary. How long were they taking? Well, it's estimated, and we can't be definitive about the dates, but that it was uh, two years, roughly. Uh, so it's a two-year trip. You don't go and make a booking with uh, Flight Center. There's no simple way. The, the, uh, the uh, journey is difficult. Um, why did they choose this route? Well, we don't know. We're not told in so many words. We're told that at Antioch, where they had stayed and were building up a church, the leaders of the church in Acts chapter 13 at the very beginning, and it seems to be a very multi-ethnic church, if you read the names there, 
they decided that what they were hearing was so good that they wanted, uh, it says the Holy Spirit convinced them, that they should send out Paul and Barnabas with this message. Now, where were they to go with it? Well, Barnabas was from Crete. So perhaps he went there because he knew Crete. And Saul was from Tarsus up here in southern Turkey. So perhaps that was why they decided to move into some of the major cities in southern Turkey. So they had perhaps some familiarity with the area. They perhaps had contacts in these areas. Uh, we don't exactly know. We're not told in so many words. But this is where the first missionary trip took the Apostle Paul. And we know uh, that part of the, uh, the itinerary was going to include visiting Jewish synagogues. The Bible reading that Christine brought us took place as part of, as part of a speech, a summary of a speech given in a synagogue. In, uh, it was actually a synagogue in, uh, in Pisidia and Antioch. They had uh, visited the synagogue in Paphos, and now we're getting more of what was said up there. And we, we can see quite clearly, if you compare back with what Peter said, that the gist of his sermon was the same as Peter's. That in Jesus, the whole Old Testament, the whole Jewish story has come to a climax. This is the conclusion. In fact, in our Bibles, the four Gospels, each one in its own way, presents the, the conclusion of the story of the Jewish people. And it wasn't the conclusion that they expected. It was dramatically different from what they expect. But there were people in these cities, because Jews were spread, the Jewish diaspora was right around the Roman Empire. There were Jewish people who knew this backstory and to whom they could go with the message. And there were roads for traveling. And the Apostle Paul, contrary to the Caravaggio image, which I put on the front of the leaflet a few weeks back, uh, probably walked, didn't have a horse, wasn't knocked from a horse when he had his vision on the road to Damascus, but he walked these roads. The sea lanes were less secure than the roads. Uh, they, their navigation, they were familiar routes that they traveled, but the weather was a great challenge at times, as we can discover later on in other in a second journey in Acts. So, this was, uh, this was the, the itinerary uh, and the time frame and some idea of why they were going to share the good things that they had discovered in Antioch. So what about their message then, the engagement that they, they had? Well, I've already uh, hinted at this. They, as they walked down these Roman roads, and this is an image of the road into Antioch, uh, which is still there today, uh, I've... Uh, I've alluded to the fact that they went to the synagogue. We, we, in these two chapters, we have reference to them in the synagogue at Paphos in, Cyrus, in Cyprus, in Pisidia and Antioch, and in Iconium. These were major cities. Uh, I think I read that uh, Iconium uh, was, is today the sixth city in Turkey. Today, Iconium is called Konya. If you want to look up Iconium, on a map, they'll take you to a town called Konya, which has, a, I think, a couple of million inhabitants. Uh, so uh, synagogues were a point of contact, and it was deep engagement. We discover that when the apostles were there, Paul and Barnabas, they were invited to speak. If you've got a message of encouragement, they went through the usual prayers and the reading of the Torah, but there's a point in the sermon where visitors were invited to speak. And that's when the Apostle Paul spoke. Uh, his, his sermon, which uh, Chris, we've, Christine read about uh, two-thirds of it. So that's the message. It was about Jesus. It was about how somebody whom we, he says, we, we Jews, we killed him. Uh, he was put to death uh, by the Romans, but we, it was us, our leaders, who did this. And we did not know it, but he died for our sins, and he is risen again. And, and so the, the message that Peter preached, the message that Peter preached not only on Pentecost, but in the, in the house of Cornelius, remember that Gentile, giving us the idea that it's not just for the Jews, it's going to be opened up the way the Old Testament had said it would be. So they had the Hebrew scriptures. And of course, this whole part of the world still spoke Greek. 
the Western Empire, the Roman Empire, was perhaps a bit more Latin, but Greek was spread through the whole area since the time of Alexander. So they didn't have to start learning a whole swathe of new languages. They were happy with the three they had, the Latin, the Greek, and the Hebrew. So that was doing, serving them really well. So it was deep engagement, but beyond that, there were other venues. They met a magician in Cyprus, and when that man was addressed, and uh, because of his, uh, he experienced a blindness that came upon him as a result of Paul uh, rebuking him, uh, the, the proconsul on the island, a Roman representative on the island, becomes a believer. So we're getting the idea that even Romans can be believers in Jesus. Cornelius already, and now the proconsul. And so we're getting the sense that beyond the synagogue, the message can be received and welcomed. Uh, later on in Lystra and in Der Derby, uh, we're told that uh, not only in these smaller towns, but in the countryside as they journeyed to them, they shared the message about Jesus. And it wasn't it wasn't uh, necessarily connected with the Jewish backstory. For example, in uh, Lystra, there was a story, it comes to us through the Roman poet Ovid, uh, that Hermes, uh, that uh, uh, Zeus and Hermes visited the area at one time in the ancient past. And, and uh, they were, as a, as a well-known story in that part of the world, and when Paul and Barnabas uh, performed a miracle there. Uh, they said, this is Zeus and Hermes come to visit us. And so they started to get ready to worship Paul and Barnabas. And this was exactly what Paul and Barnabas didn't want. It's kind of an ironic turn in the tail in chapter 14. And so they said, no, we're just men with a message. You've got to get this straight. And so that message that the creator that you worship in these funny, strange ways, through idols that are really nothing, that will crumble and fall. These, uh, there is a creator who deserves your worship and who gives us good things. And we can tell you about him. And so they're introducing really the story of Genesis and the creator. They're working way back there to bring the story to the non-Jewish community. So we get this idea that the, the engagement is not just fleeting, it's not just notes in your letterbox, it's getting alongside people week by week by week. And, uh, and uh, engaging at a deep level. Now, the message wasn't always welcomed. In fact, there was opposition. The message confronted people. It was saying that there's, a, there's cause to change your mind about the way you live and think. The whole itinerary was generating a massive change and they experienced not only welcome in the synagogue as they did initially, but also rejection. Some grew jealous that this man's ideas were pulling together more people from the town than the, the synagogue did. And so there was hostility towards them. And, uh, and the hostility uh, and the welcome went hand in hand. And so Paul and Barnabas ret retraced their steps, came back to the uh, Turkish coast, caught a boat back to Antioch. And at Antioch, uh, this uh, second or third city of the Roman Empire, they shared with the, uh, the Christian community there what had happened as they made this remarkable journey. And we, we um, read at the end of Acts 14 that they reported back and they shared uh, all that the Lord had done and they stayed a long time. So what are we to take away from this story, this narrative about these, this first missionary journey? Well, I want to suggest uh, several uh, things that we could look at and perhaps need our attention. Firstly, Paul and Barnabas established churches. That is a communities of people who shared a belief in Jesus, that he was 
in a way, the king, the one who had come to bring hope and healing to a broken world, that he was going to change their lives. So he, he established ch- communities of people. Ecclesia, the word church, means people who have been brought together, called together, called out of the community, the wider world, because of their allegiance to Jesus. They have changed their mind. I want to come back to that very idea. And in these churches, they, they appointed elders. An elder is a, an older person. Um, uh, a young, youngster is a young person. An oldster is an older person. And an elder uh, really refers to being older and having gray hair. Um, the job of an elder was to oversee or to care for or to be pastoral with respect to the community. So the, the two words, elder, describes status as an older person. In those days, older people were deemed to be uh, due respect because of the wisdom of their experience. But their job was to oversee and care for. Since the authorization, the authorized version of the Bible, the word uh, overseer, uh, episcopoi, overseeing, to scope over, uh, has been translated as bishop. That's because that suited the Anglican Church and the King James. So he wanted the word bishops to be in the Bible. So that often confuses the scene. So the elders and the bishops are the same person. It's not a hierarchical structure that's been given. It's a very flat structure, almost Presbyterian. So they established sort of someone who, someone who would care for the church and keep an eye out for it. And then the time they took. Time is probably our most precious commodity. And we probably should think about it in lockdown. I think next Sunday I want to pick up, as we move further into what was going on at this particular time, I want to pick up the use of time. But in lockdown, how do we use our time? Paul uh, took time to engage with people at a deep level and to share with them. And he was prepared to endure hardship. That's the, the other thing. Through many hardships, we should proclaim the kingdom of God. Uh, hardship is, a, is something we remind ourselves regularly of in our church. Uh, in our church life uh, this week, uh, we, we, we're suggesting that the country to pray for is Russia. And Russia is the largest country by landmass in the world. Um, and it's making, at the moment, it's been making things difficult for Christian missions in that country. Uh, only one church is really authorized. And if you've been trained outside Russia, you have to retrain in Russia. And uh, establishing a Russian seminary is extremely difficult. So read the notes when you get them and uh, think about uh, the challenge to believing people in Russia. In our own family devotions, Christine and I were reading about India. This is a a place called Sikarpai. I'm not sure how you pronounce it in in, uh, Hindu. But I I looked it up. I I read this. I read that eight Christian families have been driven out of their village by extremists. Extremists have destroyed the homes of eight Christian families and forcibly expelled them from their village. The attack was carried out in the remote community of Sikapai village in Rayagada district of Odisha in April 2021. The mob devastated the Christians' homes and forced them to leave the village. Initially, the Christian families were not allowed to recover belongings. Before police intervened to calm the situation, the families took refuge in the forest nearby. So I I thought I'd look up this town, this village, and here it is. It has a rail line passing nearby, and this is where you get off if you want to go to that village but eight Christian families forced out of their homes there in April this year. Now, we know that in other parts of the world, things are even more devastating. So there are Christian people who experience hardship. It's almost embarrassing to us that there is so little hostility. We might complain about this and that. But even this week, the parliament in Victoria agreed to keep the Lord's Prayer as the start of every day. 
And Tim Costello said, and I think he almost persuaded Sammy Jay on 774, that even for cultural reasons, it's a good thing. Because we want our political leaders to know that they too need their sins forgiven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And that there is justice and peace to pursue. So these things uh, all come through in Paul's ministry. But there is something else. There is the door of faith. And this is what they come back to report. That God has opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, a door is a wonderful thing. If there's no door, you can't go there. If there's just a, a wall. But if there's a door, you can, it can be opened and you may gain access. And the door of faith is a way of transformation. That's what the apostles talking about here. It's a, a door to a new way of being a human being. Now, Paul is later to write to the Romans in his most full statement of the Christian faith that he wants them to be transformed by the renewing of their minds that they might prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need to ask, have we entered through the door of faith? Have we come to Christ and invited Jesus to be our Lord and our King? You heard in the um, Bible Project video that... Uh, that the apostles were proclaiming a king and the words were, who rules by self-sacrifice and love. Who would sign up to self-sacrifice and love? Well, in the notes, I quote from Greg Sheridan's article that John Leach sent in to us. This is what was said at the, in that article at the end. Instead of mounting a military or political challenge, Paul revolutionized the inner identity of pagan society. He tore its mind out. In his lucid, penetrating, unprecedented writings, he left a blueprint of how it was done. N.T. Wright, one of the great Paul scholars, argues that Paul was inventing a new way of being a human being. A human being committed to self-sacrifice and service, loving service. This is what our Lord, the Son of God, has done. And we're invited to follow in his steps. May his spirit guide us to that end. Amen. Now as we come to prayer, I just want to share some of the things that have uh, touched me this week. And we'll have a, a moment or two for remembering thoughts of our own hearts. And then we'll invite, I invite you to join with me in that Lord's Prayer, which our Parliament says day by day. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, we are so grateful that you moved the saints in Antioch to send out Barnabas and Saul to do the work that was prepared for them and open the door of faith to the Gentiles. Lord Jesus Christ, as Christians, today we thank you that by your life perfectly con you perfectly conformed to the loving and redeeming purposes of the Father. You gave your life to redeem all who sat in darkness and to provide for us the needed grace and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we worship you for the love and mercy that you have purposed to be made known to us, that we might be transformed from enemies to friends, by the renewing of our minds and the experience of that forgiveness. We thank you that in Victoria our political leaders will continue to be reminded daily of their need for forgiveness in the daily recital of the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples. Help them to see its summons to justice, wisdom and mercy and to avoid vain or empty repetition. Draw near to us now as we pray. We thank you for the churches of Whitehorse. Help us as we seek to support one another in this time of COVID, to bring to the residents of Whitehorse your message of acceptance and forgiveness and the experience of mercy. We pray too for the Presbyterian churches to which we are connected Lead us by your spirit to model the faith we profess, 
conforming our lives more and more to your will and purpose. We are very aware of the hostility which many have for the disruption that the gospel brings in human behaviour and customs. We have considered it in ancient times, but we know Christian people experiencing bitter hostility in Nigeria, in China, in India, among other places. We pray that you will sustain all those whose hope is in Jesus their Lord. Help them never to be ashamed to be named among his disciples. So may their witness to the truth as it is in Jesus be fruitful for his kingdom. We are conscious of the rise in COVID infections and the difficulties lockdown impose across the whole community. Guide our political leaders that as they seek the safety of the community, they may work with renewed harmony from state and federal levels. We're conscious that there are surging cases of infection in other countries. Help us to know our role in encouraging and supporting the vaccine rollout wherever we can. We remember elderly, vulnerable and sick friends this morning who along with parents of school children will face difficulty in lockdown this week, bring encouragement and healing to them now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. So, Lord, old and young, families near and far, loved ones and others whom we only know are struggling, we lift to you. Help them cast their care on you and to know that to you they are precious. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who gave us this prayer to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, the day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, God bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.